Welcome to the MyPersonalFootballCoach.com Youth Soccer Player Development Podcast, Episode 10 with Michael Beal. Welcome to MyPersonalFootballCoach.com's Soccer Player Development Podcast. Discover all the secrets, hints and tips about soccer player development and soccer coaching from some of the leading figures in world soccer. Here's your host, Saul Isaacson Hurst. Hi guys, welcome back to another show. This week we've got a fantastic guest, someone who's not only a fantastic inspirational coach for for anyone involved in uh, youth football, but someone also who's just a generally nice guy, someone I'm pleased and lucky enough to call a mate and who's had a big impact on my career as well. It's Michael Bill. Michael's uh, worked at Chelsea and Liverpool at Always Groups. Um, he was then uh, 23's coach at Liverpool before now being assistant manager at Sao Paulo FC in Brazil, the uh, only Englishman coaching in Brazil. Fantastic honour. Uh, he's got lots of lots of great information and knowledge and experience to share. Um, if you're interested in coaching and player development, this is a really a, a must must listen. And uh, so I'm sure you're going to enjoy it. Uh, from my side, I've got so we've been uh, tra- I've been traveling lots and lots the last few months. Back in England now for a good few weeks. So uh, this is the first of many podcasts coming up. So I hope you enjoy it. Please send, keep sending that feedback. And if you've got time, please leave a review on iTunes. It really does mean a lot. So we really appreciate it. And uh, without further ado, let's get into it. So, Michael Beal, welcome to the show. Hi, Saul. How are you, mate? Very well, thanks. Thanks for taking the time, mate, to talk to us. No, it's a pleasure, mate. It's a real, a real pleasure. Can you just uh, give us a brief uh, outline of your, your uh, playing and coaching career? Yeah, I was, I was uh, a young player and I joined Cholton Academy as like a 10-year-old, made it all the way through the age groups and, and had a year as a pro and, and it didn't work out. Um, I spent a little bit of time in Holland and, and come back and was knocking around in non-league in, in sort of South London and Surrey area. And I had a chance to uh, start a soccer school. So I actually started a soccer school that focused on football de Salau or futsal in a church hall. It wasn't the best business plan because... I charged £4 an hour for the kids and only three kids turned up and I was paying £30 for the hall. So I was actually down quite a lot just in the the first week. But it grew and uh, and my passion for coaching grew and and I eventually ended up stopped playing. After about six months, I was lucky enough uh, to meet a guy called Damien Matthew, who was a youth development officer at Chelsea at the time. And and it just went from there, like, and my passion grew, and, and, and Chelsea helped me a lot. And, and I ended up going full time at Chelsea and spending 10 years there, which was fantastic for me. Um, and a real top academy. And then in 2012, just in a crazy meeting, really, just on holiday in, in, in Mallorca visiting my parents, I managed to uh, meet Frank McParland, who was the academy manager at Liverpool at the time, and, and then had the opportunity to come to Liverpool as under 15, 16, head of that department. And after two months, I moved to the under 21s uh, as assistant and then full-time coach. So I stayed in all four and a half years at Liverpool and unbelievable football club. Real, you know, it was a a fantastic time for me there. And uh, again, really, for a chance meeting, the current manager of Sao Paulo, uh, a big legend, Rogerio Senni, come to do a study visit in England and asked, uh, through a mutual friend if he could come to Liverpool and watch me work and we spent a day together and then probably two months later he was offered the job here and, and that's how I ended up coming here to, to Sao Paulo as assistant manager. So had all in all around 15 years experience in, in youth development at Chelsea and Liverpool. Extremely fortunate for that because you work with very good coaches and, and some top first team managers you get to see their ideas and, and some excellent young players and then this experience in South America, I think, is is invaluable for me. So thinking about that, your your coaching journey, which is an, it's an amazing one, inspiring one for us, all of us coaches. Uh, who do you think, who would you call the, the biggest um, influences on yourself as a coach in terms of your coaching methodology? 
we were lucky at Chelsea because there was a lot of top managers that came and went. So as a Chelsea fan, as a kid, you know, when I first went to Chelsea, Ranieri was manager, um, and then Mourinho came in, and I was really inspired by him, um, just in terms of the confidence he had in his method. Um, and, and Neil Barth, the academy manager at Chelsea, was very good at drip feeding down um, things from the managers. And, and once or twice we were able to go over and watch. So there was like Hiddink, Ancelotti in that time. Dias Boas was a very good field coach, Carlo Ancelotti. But also I was lucky enough to work with people like Brendan Rodgers, who was a U team coach at the time. And, and, and Brendan was very approachable. And then there was Steve Clark and there was... Paul Clement and, and Steve Holland, people that have gone on to you know do very well, Eddie Newton. But a big influence, I suppose, was Damien Matthews because Damien gave him my first job. And then when Damien, uh, as a part-time coach, when Damien left to go and be youth and reserve coach at Cholton, I got his job full-time. So he was a big uh, person in terms of opening the door. And I have to say, my friendship with Alex Inglethorpe when I moved to um, Liverpool meant that both of us was able to do some fantastic work together. And we've probably had a big influence on each other in the last five years in terms of how we work and how we inspire each other. But I, I, honestly, I honestly do think that I was lucky enough to work with some fantastic young players and they probably were the ones that pushed me on the most. Um, you know, for all of the, the love of first team managers for what they do, like Mourinho, when he won the title as a Chelsea fan, I was infatuated with him. I've got to be honest, my development has become more from working with the young players and, and them inspiring me and, and more in individual development. And I, I think that my first starting out working in football with Salah or futsal in the hall sort of, it stuck with me a lot, you know, and, and a lot of my experiences as a player, my own sort of uh, weaknesses as a player, I didn't really want a, uh, another kid to go through what I went through when I when I got to a level where my weaknesses probably outweighed my strengths. That was always a big passion for me. So in terms of like, um, so what's, I mean, you worked your way up. You mean you talk about your your your, your, your first soccer school there, and um, when you were at Chelsea, what age groups did you work with at Chelsea? What was the age range span there? Well, when I first started, I was putting the cones out for the under sixes and sevens at uh, a development centre down in Kidbrook in South London. And then I then I took over that centre for six to eight year olds and then ended up taking over the whole programme of like 10 development centres. And that was 23 staff, probably 60 scouts in the, in the London area. So I was overseeing the six to sort of eight age group, uh, picking a group that the club would eventually select from to to select the under nines team. Uh, I was an assistant of under nines. Then I was the coach of the under tens for two or three years. One year coach of the under 13s and then probably four to five years of the under 14s. So uh, I had varied, I'd worked in the foundation phase extensively um, and really sort of challenged myself to be an expert in that stage um, about you know uh, birth rates and about how players learn and. Uh, and just lots about players in that sort of age group. And then move to the youth development phase at, at both Chelsea and Liverpool. And then lucky now, I've, I've worked through every phase. So I feel, you know, I feel really privileged for that. Do you think then, um, do you think, like two two points to this question. Firstly, do you think it's important to, you know, have that range of experiences as a coach? And two, did you always feel that, you know, you wanted to end up working with uh, pros at the know the, the top end of that scale I think if you ask me now what was my happiest time it was when I first started so if you say when was you most exploring most developing where did you see sort of the love for football the most from the kids I'll go back to them first days at Kibra and I'll go back to when I was working um, at Chelsea with people like Bob Osborne taking the under nines and tens that was a fantastic time for me because I was sort of early to mid 20s and I was learning so much and like I was just literally living eating and breathing football then you look up the age groups and like yeah I think it's, it's a natural thing that you, you gain experience and you move up you know as you see the players getting older you sort of move up with them but it, it wasn't necessarily an aim I think when I first started coaching I wanted to be a manager um, as I say I was inspired by people like Mourinho but now when I now I'm sort of at that stage. I just want to be a developer, really, and, and hopefully take uh, some youth development, individual work into the first team setting. And if there's one thing that I would say about first team, sometimes it's a bit impersonal, the coaching. It's a bit too team and game related, and I think there's a lot of gains to be made um, 
individually. I think there's a you know I think you, when you look at the top top players in the world and the top players playing currently in the Premier League, they're obsessive. So they want to learn and they want to keep moving forward. So I think whether a player's 21 or whether he's 27, I think they both want to de develop. I think they both want to work. And I, I'm really intrigued in that. I think I want to try and use the same techniques that I use um, through the age groups. And what I'll probably encourage young coaches uh, to do is just develop players who can play 1v1 in all facets of 1v1, but who think, think of the game in 2v1. And, and because that's how I still work now, very much um, value the ab player's ability to be able to play 1v1 on all our facets of the game. But I love players to think 2v1 and I don't really coach outside that. I think tactics are really overrated. I think it's more about people and, and knowing the people you have and how you can allow their identities to shine in the team. I think that's it. I think there's no quick fix of watching a coach on YouTube or watching an analysis of the way a coach plays in terms of tactically and trying to apply that to your team. I think that's a short term. I think the long term is more based in, in, in communication and, and getting the best out of your individuals. But unfortunately, so I don't think that uh, coach education speaks about communication until you're already at a very, very advanced stage of the courses. But I think communication is key uh, in coaching. So just thinking, of, just going back a little bit there, you talked about 1v1 and 2v1. Just obviously 1v1 is, uh, obviously, as you know, it's a, it's a passion of mine and it's, I think it's important as well. And, you know, countries like Belgium have made it a pillar of their development structure and obviously Ajax and Sporting Lisbon, that is. But there seems to be, in England, there's, um, it's not really recognised as a, an important thing in terms of, you know, the federation. Um, it's, it's not a big part of the the uh, coaching development program. So what, what do you think we can do to, do you, it's obviously you think it's important, but how can we improve that sort of, um, you know, the outlook, the uh, think, perception think, of 1v1? Yeah, I think firstly the FA have improved, but no one's going to stand still. The other countries are not going to stand still why we've had to improve. I don't think we were in a fantastic place. So yes, we've improved, but the other countries are not waiting around for us to make that improvement. So I think we're always playing catch up. I think secondly, the FA, uh, in my opinion, should get people um, on the courses speaking more often and demonstrating that are working within the clubs and respected for that type of work. I think that's very, very important. You know, the FA employees are all very, very good at their job. Uh, no one's criticising them, but they're not working day to day in, in the club, um, which is a fact. It's not an opinion. That's actually a fact. And I think that, that that's a big thing. I think also, like... Uh, when you talk about one to one, I think people uh, they don't they don't necessarily understand. So I think they believe we're talking about circus acts with people run, you know, making four or five step overs and drag backs here and there. It's not that. It's understanding your personality as a player as you grow, just like you understand your personality as a as a person, and then making that your identity and sort of knowing yourself as a player, having a real self worth and identity as a football player. And for playing one v one is different for different types types of players and if we speak just about famous ones Xavi outplays 1v1 completely different to Messi Iniesta outplays similar to both but in his own unique way and and likewise it could be a Busquets he outplays by in his intercepting reading of the game and defending the ability to play 1v1 is different for for each player but it's knowing your identity and knowing your strengths and then looking to improve improve your game I think I think that's crucial. I think other countries have not got it completely right. I'm lucky enough to to work at a level now where I have connections in, in a number of countries and, and every country speaks the same, whether you're French, whether you're Spanish, whether you're Dutch, all countries and here certainly in Brazil complain about their their FAs and the coach education. So I think we need to look at the courses as sort of um, as, as like learning to drive and then um, after you drive, then it, after you get that uh, pass on your to get your driving license, it's what you make of it. And then I think it's really important that uh, there's a lot of mentors out there, and there's, and there's more people sort of talking about the individual development. I think the reason people shy away from it, it's much easier to to throw a ball in amongst ten or fifteen players and and say go on get on with a, a small sided game, and it is actually to break it down and speak to an individual and improve them because. 
I think uh, you have to then have a personality to inspire. And I've always said, unless you have a personality to inspire, then you, you shouldn't be a football coach. You know, there's lots of other jobs in football you can do because our young kids deserve that. They deserve to have people in front of them that that can inspire them. But also, we're in a, we're in a in a in a climate now where, especially in from the federation, they're saying you know everything, most things should be done in a game environment. And I think that's where there's been a bit of confusion. People are then thinking that nothing can be done individually and everything has to be done in a game. So often now you'll see people are just throwing a ball in there and letting them get on with it in a, in a you know, 7v7 or an 8v8 or whatever. Yeah, I think the thing is, you know, for my advice would be for coaches, like stop planning rules, start planning communication. Because I think there's, there's two things really. Like Our kids are not playing on the streets. We know that. And we're in a time where, you know, like video games are everything now. Um, and so when they are at training, you do need to maximise the time playing the game. I do believe that. But I don't think the game then should have like 50 rules. I think the game should be very simple and be based on the game of attack and defend the goal of equal teams and playing. But then who you speak to and why you speak to them is more important than the rules. So I would really encourage coaches to really like, what message are they trying to get across? Which player are they trying to affect and how? And there's loads of ways you can affect a player nowadays. You know, like, you know, if we, if we, if we look at the amount of video analysis that's out there of good players, you know, and breaking down what is dribbling compared to running with the ball and how do you, I think the biggest thing we don't have in England is the ability to protect the ball and twist and turn. So like receiving skills, I think is huge. You've only got to watch, you know, if you put someone like David Silva's name into, into uh, you know, a, a search on the internet, and you'll see the way he twists and turns just using his left foot. Mind, he's not two-footed. Predominantly uses his left foot inside and outside cutting of the ball, using of his arms and his body to twist and turn. I think you can break that down and teach a young player that, and I know that you're passionate about that as well. And I think that that's just you know, little evasion games at the start of the session, 1v1, 2v2. And so it's still fun. It's attack and defending goal. I think when people talk about individual development, they think you're taking one kid away from a session of 15, 16 players. And then I can understand why people think, well, how do you do that? That's difficult. Which player do I take out? I think you can make the training very, very individual in a group setting. It's just planning, I think. And I would love to see more coach education in that side. Um, and it's something that when I have time, I would love to sort of be involved in as well, because I think it's key. I think that, you know, coming here to Brazil and just seeing how comfortable the players are on the ball, it, you know, the, the average player here is far more comfortable than the good player at home. I think uh, we'll come on to that in, in a bit, the uh, differences with the players. But I think also just looking at that, do you think it's obviously as part of the culture as well that, you know, won the, uh, the, the emphasis on team and getting them move the ball quickly but obviously English football traditionally being very direct and moving the ball and you know the emphasis on getting that ball forward quickly do we are we allowing our players enough time to stand the ball and, and make mistakes and you know and try try those 1v1 moves in, in game situations yeah I think if we talk about the, the elite or not the elite I think if we talk about the best players in each country then from what I've seen of the English players and you'd have been lucky enough, like myself, to work at Tottenham and Chelsea with some fantastic young players. The difference between the Brazilian best players and our best players is nowhere near as big as people think. The big difference is the opportunity afforded to them players. Then if you look at the general standard, so like what you would call your next level of players, then here, similar to Holland as well, technically the players are better and therefore makes for a smoother game. But the other thing, you're 100% right in terms of the culture. It's a very laid back culture here. No one really rushes too much about time. We have a lot of uh, days of full sunshine, lots of daylight hours where kids are outside playing. And it's a very creative culture where if you change that to our culture at home where people are sort of rushing around with their daily schedules, very set in their way in terms of times in each day when they're gonna do things, it sort of changed, like the culture does have an impact. It does, I think um, like here, uh, players are very, you know, very creative and play on in intuition. And coaching is left to a bare minimum in terms of um, the coach education program. Here is nowhere near as advanced in England. So there's, there's a lot, of, there's a lot of uh, different reasons, but culture is a big thing. And I think also 
you know, pace of life as well. It sort of breathes into the football. But as I say, the, the biggest problem we have at home is I know, having worked with our best players uh, in England in that 17 to 21 age group and seeing the best players here in Brazil, I know we have good players, but I just don't know how they're going to get a break. So, I mean, talking about those players and just going winding back a little bit, um, just obviously I, I was lucky enough to work at that amazing in that amazing environment but just tell people you know in your time at Chelsea why have they had so much success at youth level I mean what makes that such a good quality environment I mean and then obviously then why maybe haven't those players had the opportunity to come through as maybe some others have in other places I think firstly that facilities and staff, I think uh, people outweigh facilities, but at the time that Chelsea opened Cobham and, pe and parents came across there and then the way the staff treated them um, and the way the sessions were run, uh, I think it enabled Chelsea to be uh, fantastic in recruitment, in bringing players into the club. And I think then they've been very consistent uh, coaching program under Neil Bath, you know, very, very consistent coaching program. Didn't mess around with staff too much. So the players were happy, parents were happy, and, and it sort of moved on a conveyor belt. Problem being at the top end, the managers have always been under a lot of pressure. No manager stayed there for a long period of time. I think just Mourinho, three seasons, probably in the last 15 years in terms of having a consistent manager, and then it's been hard to break through. In that time, that's been very, very disappointing for a number of staff there. And me personally, I, I, was, I was sort of disillusioned a little bit by it because we had a number of players that were better than some squad players that the club brought in. Um, but that doesn't mean the people at Liverpool, um, at Chelsea, didn't do a fantastic job. They did do a fantastic job. It's just so hard. And when you move to Liverpool, it's, it's really different because the club have a history of bringing players through and it's a very proud area. It's a smaller area, you know, a smaller city, of course. So the people in the city are much more engrossed in the club and they all almost demand young players to come through. And so the pathway to Liverpool's first team, which had a slightly smaller squad and budget, was much easier in terms of getting players through. And then what happens when one or two get through is it creates so much energy and enthusiasm into the staff and young players that the sort of next one comes. It's inevitable that the next one comes. And, you know, it, it, it's disappointing in some ways because that Chelsea and, and now Man City have to be very careful that you can win every single youth trophy but that's not the aim of an academy that's a good sign that an academy might have good players and a good group but that's not the sign that's not actually the reason for having an academy the reason for having an academy is to give a young player a chance to fulfill his dream now Chelsea are doing that via the loan market and I think Man City will go down that that route as well and it's a shame really that their young players can't get through to the first team because they are the best ones in the country so if they don't get through we lose them and I'm not sure as a country we can afford to lose them. We have a problem with the Premier League. We have too many foreign owners and, and therefore um, a, lot of, a lot of interest in bringing players in from outside. You know, I think clubs would like young players to come through but don't need them to. Um, and, and so that's a problem. If you look at Ger in Germany, Germany have all German managers and they have all German uh, owners. And therefore, there's a lot of people looking out for young German kids. And I don't think they would sell the dreams of their own kids to bring foreign players in. So I think that they, their moral towards giving opportunities to young players is very much in place. I don't think we can change the Premier League, but I think we need to look at the championship down as the English leagues and understand that the Premier League is probably the world's league uh, and, and money talks in, in that sense. But it's a concern because we have very good coaches and I think we have very good players and, and we're the world's best at bashing ourselves on the heads and saying we're terrible when actually I don't see it. You know, I've, I've been able to travel extensively in football and I just don't see how terrible we are. I just see we have bad opportunities for our young players. I mean, you, you also see that you, like myself, have... Uh travelled around Europe with, with your boys at both Chelsea and Liverpool before you left. I mean, that's what I say as well. You know, they, our young players, you know, are matched, you know, pretty matched up to any play players I've seen in Europe individually. Now, technically, they are. But, like, I um, mean, you obviously work at the top end there. What is, what's the difference, if any, between, you know, those boys you had at Chelsea in the 14s or the Liverpool boys you were touring with compared to their Dutch or Spanish compatriots? No, nothing really. Nothing really. I, I wouldn't want to be a Dutchman at this moment in time, if I'm honest. I think that 
you know, they look at maybe, you know, there's two things about the Dutch event. We all love it. You know, Johan Cruyff and is my idol in terms of coaching. It's, it's, it's the person, it's like the lighthouse for me, the guides the way out, you know, like, infatuated with him and, 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 and his views on football. And so he's opened the door to a lot of Dutch coaches to, to go outside. So his methodology has been carried on through thousands of coaches who have left Holland to go outside and coach. And maybe they forgot to stay at home and develop their own, maybe. But another reason for the Dutch maybe not doing as well as previous years, it's not a huge country. So when they produce players, they generally stay together for a generation. People like Robin, Van der Vaart, Snyder, Van Persie played together in the national team for nearly eight to ten years. So if one of that generation, if the young players are, you know, come across to the English academies, to a Man United, to a Chelsea, a Man City, a Liverpool, and don't break through, that's really costly to Holland. You know, because it's only a small country, so they only have a small amount of top players that they're producing, just purely by the size of the population. So, you know, I wouldn't want to be in their shoes. And I, I think that when I go out and see, culture plays a big part in football. So it's hard to make an English boy from the northwest move like a Spanish boy, say, from Valencia, and how they see the game and their feel and touch. The game's played at different speeds. And if the game's played at different speeds for seven or eight years of your development, it becomes ingrained in your game. But I do think in England, we have a lovely dynamic now, of real athleticism, but technically really gifted players too. It's just between 17 and 21, our players are not playing. I was, you know, the fact recently of the England German under 21 teams, where we had probably 130 first team appearances over the season across our whole squad, and they had nearly 2,000. You're talking about players that are 18, 19, 20, 21. They're in, you know, if you said a boy from the age of 12 to 14 never played football, only trained football, you know, you'd say, well, he's not going to develop as much as a boy that does play and does feel free and is learning, exploring from the game. So we can't, you know, at 17 to 21, it's a critical time. It's a critical time mentally, I think. I think you wait all your life to get to that age group. And in that age group, you're playing with your idols and you, you start to doubt yourself. And through playing, you would gain. Now, look at someone like Deli Ali. I, you know, I was privileged enough to be able to see Deli Ali when he was younger, and he was a good player. But what Deli Ali has done is continually been able to develop and improve and get sort of feedback from the game and, and that re energize himself to get to the next level through playing. And he needed that stepping stone at MK Dons. And when I was at Liverpool, I always used to talk about Luis Suarez. At 18, he was at Nacional in Uruguay, at 19 at Groningen, at 20 at Ajax. And he has three and a half years and moves to Liverpool at 24. And three years and moves to Liverpool um, to Barcelona at 27. He had a stepping stone. He had 156 games before he got to Liverpool at a level below Liverpool. And so I think that we have to understand the pathway that our young players have to go on. If that was good enough for Luis Suarez, then it should be good. Why should we expect an 18-year-old like Shea Ojo to be at the same level as him? Also, if I look at, if you look at that front three at Barcelona, Messi had the rise like, his rise was like a rocket. He's a one in a million. It's like a Wayne Rooney or Steven Gerrard. They get in the first team, they never look back. Neymar had a different one. He stayed at Santos, which is a much lower level. He played in the state championship, which is a much lower level than the Brasileiro. Then he arrived at Barcelona and he's improved every year. And then I just explained the pathway of Suarez. We need to understand that to help our young players and our young players need to understand it. So, so in, that, how... in that, in Mike, so I, was, I said this the other day that I remember watching Leroy Sane in the UEFA 19 Champions League at Cobham. And I've said, you know, for me, he wasn't the best player on the pitch. That team, you know, that Loftus's Cheeks generation with Colker and all those guys, a team full of superstars, you know. But I mean, like I say, it's opportunity. So, you know, what do we do? How do we confront this 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 uh, wall that these young players are finding? It's very very difficult. I think in England we're not obsessed with languages. Um, and the one thing I would say to the young players is like me as a young coach. There's some real clear messages for me that if you're going to get to the next level, or you're going to try to become world class in your in, in your field, then a lot of the coaches that I really respect and learn from all spoke a second language, but I never. So it was clear where my pathway had to go next. I had to either try to study in England or I had to come abroad to try to learn a second language and a culture to improve myself. 
And I look at uh, people in England, we're not obsessed with languages. Now, the Premier League's the World's League and players all across the world would like to play in it. You know, if you said to a young Brazilian boy that Man United was interested, he'd want to go and speak to him. If you said the same to a Dutch boy that Liverpool were interested, he'd want to go and speak to him. So our players are not just competing with the to be the best in their city or the best in the country. They're competing to be the best in the world already at 17, 18. And none of our players learn a second language to go outside. So you have all these players in Europe that are learning the second language and are willing to come and play in our academies. First, I would like us to stop bringing young players in unless they're going to go directly into the first team squad. I would love to see in England that, OK, you want to bring this young player in from overseas and, and, and it's not, you know any young player, I love to see young talent get on. So it's not me picking on foreign players, it's just trying to give some restriction to allow ours to grow. But if you are going to bring a young player in, then he has to go into your 25 player first team squad which makes the owners and makes the managers and the academy managers that are bringing these foreign talents in much more accountable for the player they bring in. Um, and then also, I just think that we, we may need to look at the championship down and have real strong restrictions on overseas players. And I know that when, as part of the European Union, that's difficult. But maybe, and I'm not an expert on this by any means, under Brexit, maybe some rule changes can be made for the betterment of young English players. And for example, so if me and you became manager of a League One club tomorrow and we said, look, just for the benefit of English players, we're only going to pick British players at our club. Similar to, say, Bill Bow do in, in the Basque region. It's not a race thing. It's purely a thing on development and, and, and helping young players get through. I think we'd be the, the, everyone's second favourite club. I honestly do. I think that, that we're at that stage now in the country where people are just dying to see young English talent be given a chance. And what I would say is, Deli Alley has repaid Tottenham a thousand times over. Rashford, when he got in at Man United last year, helped Man United so much. Uh, Ward Prowse at Southampton, you name it. Up and down the country, we're a young player. Trent Alexander last month make his debut for um, Liverpool at Old Trafford in front of a packed house and, and plays outstanding. All of the young players that have been given an opportunity have never let their clubs down. I look at young Tammy Abrahams, a boy that I knew since the age of six and, and coached for a number of years. Going into Bristol City this year, a team struggling in the championship as an 18-year-old and scoring 20-plus goals. You know, we have talent. We just need to open the door to it. Um, I suppose you, you, you mentioned like Southampton. I suppose everyone you know talks about their academy, but the reality is obviously you know them getting relegated like they did was actually the best thing that could have happened for those players because all those players actually got to play day in day out, and that generation that came through were just like you said had the opportunity. They they were playing, and then they they developed. Yeah, if you look at Adam Lallana, Adam Lallana now being a mainstay in the England team and a fantastically gifted technical player, a real modern day player in the Premier League. Um, Adam had, uh, he played in League One for two years. I think he had two years in the Championship, a year in the Premier League before he arrived at Liverpool at 26. He wasn't ready for Liverpool at 17, 18. He had this stepping stone, like you say. Also, where you need youth development, it will occur. Where you need it, it will occur. So at clubs like West Ham and Southampton, who over the years have always produced players and done a fantastic job, there's also been a big need for players because maybe the budget of the club means they can compete with the big clubs for, say, 15 players. But they need a squad of 22. So that opens up spaces in the squad. Where at Chelsea, they have the budget for the full 25, 30 players. And so I think where you need youth development, it happens. And I think it's, it's the same. You look in Spain, a lot of the clubs are poor and in debt. You know, outside the big three or four clubs, a lot of clubs are struggling to stay afloat. Therefore, they're not going to bring in a foreign player on a higher salary. They're going to bring players from their own base or they're going to recruit players from Barcelona or, or, or Real Madrid that don't quite make the level there and give them a chance to have a, almost a second bounce on their career. It's very much the same in Holland. It's the same in Germany as well. I think what we have is we have teams at the bottom of the Premier League that can go out and spend 32 million on a player. And it's, so it's so unique. And then that even streams down to the championship. But as a country, we, 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 you know, here in Brazil, they have a big problem with the state championships and national championships and not wanting to change because it affects the smaller clubs. We have some problems in England as well that, um, you know, the Premier League's become so big that we can't control the Premier League. 
And when, when we go to the Premier League meetings about youth development, a lot of the decisions, uh, I think, lack um, integrity. I think a lot of the decisions are still based around the Premier League and, and money and finance. Well, you and, you know, the, the, the promotion of Premier League 2 and trying to have promotion relegation and money on winning the league and money for winning certain fixtures, when that was proposed... Oh, you feel like pulling your hair out because it's supposed to be youth development. You know, so talk, League... Talking about the Premier League then, sorry to interrupt you, Mickey, there. So what do you think about, um, one, the, the Premier League's, you know, um, efforts to change things with the EPPP, and then two, what do you think of like clubs like Brentford who've scrapped their academies and just gone into the look at players at the, the top end and, and there's that as a way of player development? Well, I think Brentford have realised that uh, the EPP probably didn't help them. Because uh, maybe the you know, best players were going to get cherry picked by an Arsenal, by a Tottenham, or, or a Chelsea due to the EP, EP3 not really safeguarding them to that. And that if they had a two million budget for their whole academy across ten age groups, and now they're going to spend the same two million on the seventeen to twenty-one age group, I think it's interesting for the smaller clubs because I still think what they're saying is no, we'll be outstanding at seventeen to twenty-one, and we'll try to get players through. I think it's an interesting project. It's not something that I would sort of um, advocate for all. I wouldn't want to see one of the big clubs doing it, but I do think that Brentford are a club that think outside the box. I almost applaud them in terms of giving it a go. I think the EP3 and anything where you audit, it's just what you audit sort. Do you know what I mean? It's like, you know, I don't, for me, whether a young boy wears GPS or not between the ages of 12 to 16, if that's an audit mark, then I would ask the question, why? You know, in the, in the development of a young player wearing GPS in the ages of 10, 11, 12, 13 years of age, in, the value for that to me on youth development is minimal. Um, but I do think some clubs needed to be ordered it, and I need, do think the clubs need to show where the money's going. Um, but I think clubs should be penalised more on spending money where it doesn't need to be spent as well. So I just think that we've not got it completely wrong. I think we've actually got a hell of a lot of things right. I just think that what we don't have is we have all the plans in the world from sort of 9 to 17, and we have no plan from 17 to 21 where you need it. It's like we have a bottleneck situation that we have no sort of um, solution for and because basically everything's run by money from their ages upwards. If you ask me, do we have good young coaches in England? Do we have decent coach education? Yes. Like compared to what I've experienced and spoken to very experienced player uh, coaches and and people around the world, you know, everyone sees England in a really fantastic place and loves the football in England. It's just we have a problem with the Premier League. So then, um, in uh, what's the answer then? Do you reckon is is it like beat, you know having like um, like they do in Spain having B teams like feeder teams with these get these young players in? Yeah, maybe I think I think and I, and I would like to see some some stricter rules coming in from the Championship down. I would like to say that the League One down should only be for British players. I'd like to see maybe Championship having some big restrictions and maybe three to five players on players outside. I think that if in as part of the European Union, you was never going to have that because we were part of the union with freedom of movement in football was one of the only industries that didn't work because none of our players had any interest of going and living and playing outside. I would also like to see there to be um, like a salary cap for young players. And I want it to, you know, and if it's broken by clubs in any sort of underhand way, I think there should be real firm sanctions because I just think we have a too much too soon culture that we pay players for what they might do in the future rather than waiting and then giving them uh, the rewards for their good work and anywhere else in the world that doesn't happen. You know, these young South American players literally are fighting for every contract to make life easier for themselves and their families out of poverty. There's a real need to play football, not a want. And I think young kids in England want to play football and then they're rewarded handsomely too soon, but then are put in a toxic situation of a under 23 league, which is still a youth development league, played in front of no people and very sporadic. So I think there should be some restrictions on the amount of foreign players playing in the, in the leagues outside of the Premier League. And I think that we should have a salary cap for young players. Um, and I think the clubs should see these young players as like managing or, 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 or bringing up their own child. And 
I don't know. People are different. But if I was a millionaire, I don't, I'm not sure that I would just give um, my son my bank account. I think I would make him earn the living and earn a way in life the same way I had to. And I think that clubs need to be have real strong morals and integrity around the way they bring young players up. But as I say, I think there's a hell of a lot of good work being done. I don't want to come across as, 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 as slamming everybody because I think we do a really good job. We just have a problem with the finance and the steam train of what is the Premier League. And it's a problem that the Premier League probably run youth development in England because ultimately it's an organisation that is, is purely, in my opinion, focused on income and growing the brand of the Premier League. Just um, before we go on just to your life in Brazil, Mickey, just want to just chat quickly about a uh, little bit about Liverpool. Obviously. I was lucky enough to work with Alex Inglethorpe at Spurs, see him a lot. He was a massive you know, uh, influence on my coach and really inspiring coach. Just tell us a little bit about the philosophy at the club when he was head of the academy. And in, in terms, was, it, was there any differences, the similarities and contrast and differences to the, uh, the, at Chelsea? Um, Alex like my best friend in football, like, with, like my older brother. We had a fantastic relationship together there, along with Pepin Linders, who was a guy that I knew and introduced to Alex and we ultimately brought to, to uh, Liverpool. And our big thing was, uh, if you ask really in the short one, what was our philosophy? It was uh, 1v1, invent yourself. How can you outplay? But everything come back to the 1v1. A lot of times in training, it was man v man. Two or three minutes, change your opponent, get experience of playing against different shapes and sizes, different strengths and weaknesses, and being solution based. And we were quite aggressive in how we got into players in that session as well. Okay, not in the younger ages, but in the older ages, certainly. A lot of uh, 1v1 at the start of the session, taking it into games, coming back out to position specific or individual work, especially in the older ages. But we were, also, we were a young staff. Alex was a young academy manager. I was a young under-23 coach. Pepin was a 32, a young under-16s coach and now first team uh, uh, coach. So we were very, very aggressive and energetic in how we worked. And we recruited staff to work with us that were like that as well. Um, had debates every Monday that Alex would bring the staff together to have debates about football and and nothing was sort of closed. It was all open. We had some real clear principles, but very rarely spoke about tactics. We would talk about positioning on the pitch and we would talk about circulation in the ball and we would talk about making the pitch smaller and we didn't have it. But it was always, who's your best players? How are you going to get them the ball? Who's your best players? Who's this session for? Who's your best players? How are you affecting them today? How are you managing your staff? No Superman sessions. You just get more people out on the on the pitch and working together. Let's bring back some ex players like Rob Jones, Stuart Manaman, Robbie Fowler, Michael Owen at times. Now Stephen Gerrard, Steve Highway. Bring back these people that can really help us. There was no ego, and then just working every day. It was it was a beautiful place to work and challenging at times as well because it was relentless. But I miss it. I miss that. I really do. Uh, I just felt for my development, I had to move on, but I miss that. Differences from that to Chelsea. Well, Chelsea, again, had a real solid idea of how they wanted to play and be perceived. So everything led towards that. It was less individual, but it was they had overall a higher level of player. It was less individual, in my opinion. Certainly up until the under-16 age group, it was more... 9s to 12s had a real lovely individual development program. 12 to 16 was more about a philosophy and style of play. Um, and that was fine. Both clubs have been successful. And for me, it was an unbelievable development of both, across both. As a Chelsea fan, I absolutely loved my 10 years at Chelsea. But my four and a half years at Liverpool just left. The, uh, maybe it's because I've seen more players reaching uh, their goal, their dream. You know, we had 18 debuts in two and a half years. Um, and really proud of that and bring, brought in nearly 36 million in sales of academy players going outside to play. So that was that was beautiful time for me, mate, if I'm honest. So um, the big move comes. You make that big flight across, obviously, with your family. Just tell us a little bit about that. You know, uh, firstly, what was like? What were those first few days or weeks like with your family, you know, making that big move to Brazil? Um, I made a decision like two or three days and... Um, to come and it was very difficult after that was quite emotional because Liverpool you know a lot of people come out and spoke and 
You know, and I was lucky that Kenny Dalglish come and see me and, and thank me for the work I've done. So I was a bit emotional, if I'm honest. Um, and then I, I left on New Year's Day to come here, and the family stayed at home for seven weeks, which was really tough. You know, my children, two and four, two little boys, dad's going away for that amount of time was really difficult. I did 18 hours of lessons, uh, one-to-one, on Portuguese in Liverpool. I've done no lessons since I've been here because I've just been working and learning from the players and the staff. I was here for two days and then we went to Florida for three weeks. So it was like I came to live in Brazil, but I actually went and lived in America, which was was lovely to get to know the staff and the players, but was frustrating because imagine I wasn't learning anything with the language. And then I've been here. We've had a game every three days. It's gone very well. We've lost one in the last 18 games. We've qualified for the semi-final of the state championship and the Sao Paulo state championship is the biggest with Palmeiras, Corinthians, Santos and ourselves in the semi-finals. Played in against River Plate. I've played against um, Corinthians now twice. Played Palmeiras, Santos, one away at Santos, which is an incredible place. You think of the history of that place with Pele. And you go away to Santos and win. That was a special day for me on the 15th of February because that's when my family arrived here. They arrived in the morning, which was fantastic for me. It was like the start of my time here. And in the evening, we went away to Santos and won 3-1 with everything around that game and the first time winning there in seven years. My family have been here just over a month and a half now. They're happy. We have a nice house. The, the boys are swimming every day, lots of ice cream. We, As a family, we're sort of studying Portuguese. And, and every day is like an adventure for them and an adventure for me. We play every three days. We was away in Buenos Aires this week for like a a Champions League Copa Sudamericana game there and that experience was invaluable to me. And I'm just learning a lot about the culture and young players. It's a, uh, it's fascinating really. There's there's a, a lot of things that I'm learning that make me confirm that the things I was doing back in England were right. It's giving more confidence and, and sort of inspiration in that. And then it's challenged me a little bit on on how foreign players rehearse more and, you know, this is an interesting point that all of the players that I've worked with um, from from European countries and now in South America, in, they use training for rehearsing. You know, we have this saying in England, like, train like you play. But in England, we don't find another level when we play the game because maybe we don't rehearse enough. And maybe, again, it's because it's too group orientated or maybe, again, it's because that's part of our culture to work like a dog in every single session. But what I see from the foreign players is a lot of rehearsing. So what do you mean now by about rehearsing there, Mickey? Be explicit. What's, what do you mean really about... Yeah, well, there's, that, mo- there's moments in the week and moments in the sessions which are for play and to rehearse. And if you are a dribbler, you maybe have time in the session, uh, maybe before or after. It has a, a lot to do with um, the sun as well. You don't rush in from training because it's raining and cold. You stay out for an extra half hour maybe and just play with the ball. But there's certain practices in the week where they rehearse. And if I look back at the young players I work with at Chelsea and Liverpool that were from European countries and South American countries, very much the same. There wasn't all their level in training was a level, but they found another level for the match day. You know, the match was everything to them. Whereas maybe some English players, you know, you have uh, the training is, is, is they train how they play. We talk about that in England, don't we? Let's train how we play. But if we train every day how we play, then when do we improve? You know, does that make sense? If we train how we played in the last game, we train at that level, then when's the moment for uh, intuition and creativity to improve? So, and I think that comes down to individual work as well as specific work. I think the big difference here is I see a lot of kids out playing. So, you know, like, and if you drive past a favela, and you'll see the favela pitches, which are horrific pitches. It's like 11 aside, 12 aside games going on with young kids of all different shapes and sizes. As I say, the Brazilians are the first to say their coach education system has not been fantastic and they feel they're behind the rest of the world in terms of tactical, but they still, for me, have the most technical gifted players. And it's a country full of very dynamic, athletic players. You know, and it's something that um, there's a natural pathway to the first teams as well. And I think a young player in Brazil that's maybe coming from a favela, and there's one or two in the Sao Paulo squad that are like this, that when they're getting our first team, it's just a stepping stone to a bigger thing. When you pay them a little bit of money, they're keen to get the next contract, next contract, because it's to safeguard generations of their family from poverty. So you just... can't, there's a real need. You can't say that a young player in England, he might want to be a footballer, but is he obsessive enough? 
So, I mean, do, do you get to see the academy much then, the younger boys play? Wow, the academy here at Cotia is amazing. You know, we've worked at good academies with good facilities. This is as good as any facility in the world. You know, it's called Cotia, C-O-T-I-A. You can see videos of the facilities maybe on, on Google. The facilities are outstanding. And it's a club that are regularly produced. We have 14 or 15 of the current squad of 28 have come through the academy. Um, we have players like Lucas Moura, Casimiro, Kaká, David Luiz, Oscar, are some of the more famous ones that have come out of the last few years. David Neres transferred for 15 million to Ajax recently, a young wide player. Uh, Lianco is a young centre defender, under 20 captain of Brazil, has just moved to Torino for 7 million as well. So it's a, it's a complete conveyor belt. Uh, one thing that's interesting is the under 20s team must play about 65 games a season. Um, so it's a lot of play, sometimes in difficult, humid situations on bad pitches, but they play, 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 play. And then there's opportunities for the young players to move to the first team squads because of finances. In Brazil, they need players to come into the first team squads because of finances, but also because most of the top players are moving outside into Europe or Asia. So it opens up space for them. So, you know, we play uh, this weekend in a game, probably 57 to 60,000 people. And we may have three or four 19 year olds playing in it. And so you think of that development at a slightly lower level to uh, maybe the main leagues in Europe. Then, boys, it's a stepping stone. So they're firing that experience, like we said uh, Luis Suarez or Neymar did. And what about what's the, uh, yourself? What's the difference between working with, now you're working at the, you know, the end of that journey with those pro players? You know, what's the, what's the difference? How have you taken to that? You know, they are, you know what's it like day-to-day -day working with those players, trying to get into them and that sort of thing compared to working with those under-23s? No, they've been, it's been fascinating really, mate, because a lot of the coaching has been very similar to what we did back at Liverpool. You know, it's one of the reasons I was inspired to come because Rogero said I had a big say on the training and we felt the same way. So a lot of the training is exactly the same. Intensity in moments is, is completely the same and at other moments is slightly lower, like I said, in terms of rehearsing. Um, but the players have been very open. We have a young squad and what I think is a hungry squad. We only have two players that are over the age of 30. So most of our players are sort of 19, 20 to sort of 25, 26 in a lovely band of sort of 24 players in that age group where no one's at the top of the mountain. So they're very much development players and have aspirations to obviously win championships here or possibly move across into Europe. So what I find is that group is, is a group of players that are, are no different to my under 23 players at Liverpool in terms of development. Obviously for me personally, I value the one-to-one -one communication um, part of coaching uh, really high, probably the highest thing in, in sort of my philosophy. So that's difficult because I don't speak the language perfectly. But uh, football words in terms of training are very easy. You only have to learn the verb. You don't need to learn the conjugation. You don't need to learn like speaking how we speak now. You need to learn stop, turn, uh, run, pass forward, 1v1, 2v1, um, press. You need to learn them words. And then football has a universal language. So it's been fascinating. I've really enjoyed it. I, I, I've got to be honest, when I left uh, Chelsea to go to Liverpool, I missed Chelsea greatly. I missed the... I miss the relationships with my friends, the staff, to share the experiences with. And it's been the same here, like, I really do miss Liverpool, but I miss sharing experiences with my colleagues, and like, I miss working with Alex and Pepin and, and Neil Critchley and that there, but I know they would love this, Saul. I know that you would love this. I know that any English coach who had this experience would love it. Um, it's a little bit tough living away from family and friends, but then having such a such a... Uh, interesting work schedule of a game every three days. You'll live in a new stadium, a new experience. Um, I think it's fantastic. Where it will lead me in the end, I don't know. But what I do know is now I'm even more infatuated with individual development and understanding cultures of different people. I think if you're lucky enough to work at a big club in Europe or anywhere in the world, you're going to have players from different backgrounds and different countries. Understanding how to manage them players I look back now and think, right, for this experience, I'd have been much better at helping a young Spanish boy be integrated into Liverpool or a young Brazilian that we had come to Liverpool integrate. I would have been a much better sort of 
mentor and guide to them, knowing more about their culture. So I think that's invaluable for me in the future. So what, um, I mean, what, I mean, you know, England's a football crazy country. What's it like in Brazil? What's the, you know, what's the football culture like there? Unbelievable. So the TV station is like 24 hours a day on football. There's three of them. They debate everything. There's a game every three days. They've got a lot to debate. Um, there's the passion of the fans comes out in the reporters. There's some that are so biased on the TV, you know, biased to the site stays that they're blind against their own team. You know, to give you an example, like when we arrived for our first home game of the season, um, there was 52,000 in the stadium, but 30,000 were outside and letting off fireworks and flares and streamers and all sorts to cheer us in the stadium. When we flew to San Luis, which is four hours away in the north, 15,000 turned up at the airport to greet us and we're outside our hotel overnight singing. I've not seen a passion like it. Last week we went and played a smaller team in Argentina away and there was 6,000 behind the goal of the other team. And I was just infatuated by watching them. Now the passion of the fans is, um, is incredible. It's absolutely incredible. You know, when I was at Liverpool, a couple of times the fans were outside Anfield cheering the team in, and it made like big headlines because it was quite a unique thing. Here, it's like a, it's um, it's just an every game thing. And one thing that you know we we've done very well in England to get over the hooligans, you know, the hooligans problem because here you're not allowed away fans in the big games. So in the classical classicos against Palmeiras or Corinthians, it's just home fans. Well, that's okay when you're at home, but you try going into them stadiums, mate, when it's 45,000 just of the other team, you know, the influence that can have on the ref and one or two decisions in the game and just the general feel inside the stadium. Um, so it's unique. The passion is incredible. Football in Brazil is everything. It's actually a way of life. It's far more passionate than in England. I think in England, people are very, very respectful of, okay, you play football, you, we have an opinion about the game, but then the rest of the week, your life is your life here. The football players are treated like rock stars or superstars. And what's that, what's the um, you know looking at the style of play? Is it different to England? You know, classic English football. I mean, what's it like there generally if you're looking at the way teams are generally playing and setting up? One thing that shocked me is the standard of the pitches, mate. The pitches have been horrific. Unless you play one of the big teams, the pitches have been terrible. Some pitches that I would say have been unplayable to English standards and all, don't have the sprinkler systems that we have and the stadiums vary from brilliant new stadiums to uh, really old you know, stadiums that are falling down. So that's been interesting. Also the change in heat and the fact that you play every three days has a real impact on the, on the, the speed of the game. So the heat, the pitch and the fact that you play every three days uh, probably makes most teams play um, in a very expansive with the ball, but without the ball, probably more closed, sort of medium to low block um, and waiting for opportunities. Every player in Brazil has the ability to outplay. So David Luiz is not unique in Brazil. What they would call a centre-back is a zaguero. There's many of them, you know, that try to dribble and bring the ball out of the fence and almost play like uh, attacking midfielders in that position. So when we have the ball, everyone wants to play. Um, I know they have a real infatuation with number 10s and wide players, you know, and that creative type player. It's really encouraged. It's like, you know, like it, it, it's the be all and end all that you have these players in your team that can do something that gets the crowd off of their feet. So every team sort of has uh, two wingers, a number 10 or maybe a winger and uh, two number 10s, one player to the side that comes in and they rotate. It's really an obsession. They also have a national obsession with number nines. And you think, you know, there's, there's no shock going back over the years with the type of number nines that Brazil have had. So, the, you know, the people demand attacking creative football. Um, and as you said earlier, in England, we demand energetic, aggressive attacking football. So we get that. Here, they demand creative attacking football from everybody. You know, it's, uh, the style is everything. If you have a bad style, if you make a defensive substitution, you should hear the whistles from the fans. Even if you're trying to see out a game, they won't accept a defensive substitution. It's, it's you know, the, but the, the, the people are like that. The people are very creative people, mate, in terms of just exploring the cities and, and, and meeting the people. They're sort of, you know, very creative people as, as a whole. Um, so what would you, uh, I mean, just the last few ones, uh, makes I know you're a very busy man. What, what, what advice would you give for um, 
uh, a young player, and then maybe to that that player's parents, a young player who gets maybe identified at a young age, or is gifted in football, you know, whether he's identified by academy or not, and what advice you give to that player and to their parents as well? well one big advice I would give is that no one got um, to be, a, no, none of these top players you're watching on TV got where they were because they trained two hours a day. It's not possible. So you have to train or train, you know, six hours a week or 12 hours a week, like the EPP is saying. So your practice time is everything. I think what you practice, again, is everything. But I think try to find a mentor, try to find a coach that can help you with your identity as a player. Uh, I think that's really, really important, like how you see yourself as a player. Don't try to be the jack of all trades. Try to have a real focus in, in, in your game of what you are and try to improve it. If you're a good dribbler, Okay, what does good dribbling look like at Champions League level? What When you played your toughest ever game, so if you're a 14-year-old, what was your toughest ever game and what did it demand of you? Okay, can you train above that level every day? Can you train the, to improve your techniques to be more successful in that game? And keep re-evaluating it. And I think that if you're a good dribbler, um, do you understand how to dribble and outplay someone on the right and left? Can you play with pressure on your back? Can you play with pressure on both sides? If someone stands off you, can you deliver a cross? Are you able to combine with players? So how do you sort of improve and focus your strengths? I think some of the best players in the world are quite raw. I think, you know, you look at Iron Robin, a player I love, you know, he's, he's very raw in terms of being more right, more left footed, has improved his right foot over the years. But he strengths now of speed and this unbelievable ability to come inside of his left foot and combine and score has always been his strengths. But he's just executed it every single day and just fine tuned it and fine tuned it. And I think that, you know, I think we, we're guilty of maybe rounding players off too much. So my focus would be. Just as you grow in your personality as a teenager in high school, try to grow your identity as a young player. Um, and, and then don't be scared of seeking coaching outside. Don't be scared of practicing outside your academy. Um, academy coaches sometimes are going in two staff to 16 players and they're working to a syllabus. And if that syllabus ain't specific enough for you, then I think it's important young kids go outside and, 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 and sort of, uh, and parents, you know, seek advice on the club don't have all the answers for you. And I think you have to take ownership of your development in all, in all areas, whether that's seeking um, some help of, 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 you know, to improve your agility or to improve uh, a certain technique. I just I just look at the best players in the world and there's some real clear signs from them. You know, that, you know, if anyone thinks the best players in the world just go and train at their club and don't do anything outside in their own time, I think that they're misguided. I think that the best players in the world are very, very obsessive and they live a sort of 24-7 lifestyle. And I suppose the biggest example of that would be Cristiano Ronaldo, who I think each year just keeps improving himself and modifying his game. And, and, and that's obsessive behaviour that our young people need to have. I think, yeah, I think that's an important point, mate. So there's a fallacy going around at the moment that, you know, actually the amount of hours you do isn't important. I mean, there's no, you know, there's no magic number, but like you say, it's those players, those ones who, those special ones are the ones who are obsessive and who do do the extra bit away from training all the time, you know. You obviously do other sports, get other experiences, but if, you know, if football's going to be your main one, make sure you put those, those hours and that effort into being the best you can be, right? Yeah, and I think also, like, if you focus on yourself and don't look to your left and right, I think that's very easy to... If you see it as you versus you and improving you, OK, I, I think you'll always see, you know, because everyone peaks out at a level. Everyone can play football well. It just at uh, just the different levels move. You know, like everyone can play football in their own way, can improve. Now, I think if a young player comes through and he looks to his left and right, then you get to a stage of being 19, 20, like I was, and saying it's not fair, so I was better than so-and-so. I think if you just focus on making yourself better and, and challenging yourself, you will always see the achievement you made in football. And now for young players in England, you know, I didn't make it as a professional. I was a, I had a year as a pro and I tried to go and play another country, didn't work out. I've managed to make a successful career coaching. If I hadn't got to this level and I'd have stayed coaching in Chelsea under 10, I would have still had a fantastic career coaching sort. So I think that, you know, it's, it's, it's too much hit and miss. Like we young players if they don't make it it's like they were a failure no come on you developed yourself for a number of years you can take that to play at a different level or in a different country or take a scholarship 
or become a coach and give back to the game. You know, I think that parents should focus on that. I think that, that football gives them a lot of brilliant things. But if we focus on the finances and getting to the first team, being a superstar at 17, 18, then already our mindset's wrong. We're setting ourselves up to foul. So what I would advise parents is, is like, you know, teach your child. It's you versus you. Just keep improving yourself. And, and the coaches at the clubs don't have all the answers. You probably need... You know, there's nothing wrong with a kid kicking the ball against a wall. You know, like in in the academies now, you're right in saying that you know the game, let the game be the teacher. Okay, great. But when I was young, kicking the ball against the wall was a great teacher for me, specific to me as well, to improve my right and left foot, to improve the difference between curling the ball to bending it, the foot shape, the shape of my hip, what I did with my shoulders, my arms, my head to strike the ball. That's been lost, and I think you know. There's a lot of dads out there that did that 20 years ago that now have young sons that should remind the young sons of what they did when they were young. Well, you talk about those Brazilian boys, whether they're from the favelas or not. I mean, the, the reality is they just have a much better relationship with the ball than a lot of our players do, you know, whether that's culturally and like you say now, this yeah. current environment where we're saying, you know, this this fallacy that's saying, oh, isolated practice doesn't improve your technique is that... You just need to get players on the ball more, build their relationship on it, you know, get them kicking the ball against the wall and experimenting and, you know, being creative and learning how the ball responds to their to my feet, my body, and, you know, how can I manipulate it? How can I protect it? Yeah, listen, mate, if we're in a cinema today, me and you, and you're going one, you watch a horror movie or an action-packed movie where it's 100 mile an hour, you're not as composed as me sat next door watching, I don't know, maybe a drama or something that's a little bit more low-key. And I think that's it. I think, you know, in England, we we are guilty of maybe playing the game like a roller coaster all the time, which affects composure. And we have a, a history or a culture of people on the sidelines shouting a lot, with aggr- not, not necessarily with aggression. I don't think the adults mean to show aggression. I just think it comes across to a young kid as aggression. And so, therefore, that affects composure. And if you stay in that environment for five, seven, eight, ten years, it's going to have an effect on how you play football. In this environment here with the warm weather and the more laid back lifestyle, you're, you're, it promotes composure. Um, sometimes what you might have to do to a player here is wake him up a little bit. But it's, if you, it, it's easier to speed you up than to slow you down. And I think that we have to be careful of everything being on fast forward in England. You know, like where is the time in training for actually reflection, thinking, and rehearsing and I know that you know some coaches be listening to this thinking but Mick we train in the rain and the wind and the snow sometimes I know that gents I've been there as well what I'm just trying to say is uh, is there a moment in the session where you are actually speaking to one kid about him and making it personal or you know like for, for me like the rules of 2v1 so me and you saw playing 2v1 against a defender and we ha- I have to try to find a way of putting you in front of the goalkeeper where the defender's out of the game. So how I move the defender's feet before passing to you, the, 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 the movement you make to get yourself free, I think it's fascinating. So I think you can coach that. And that's a moment for real you know, thinking time, psychology, psychology in terms of uh, mentally um, making a decision with the ball at the same time as technical as well. So I think teaching young players the rules of 2v1, the rules of 3v2, and then focusing on the individual. I think the game's not 11 v 11. I think it's a fallacy. I think pause any game that you're watching on TV and draw a 20 by 20 metre box around that picture and you'll find that it's 3v2, 2v1, 3v3. And kids love that. Play little, little games like that. But, you know, encourage certain things. Encourage if you outplay 1v1 and score, it's worth two. Encourage if you can score for 1-2, it's worth two. Whatever you want to promote today. But when you go out there to coach young kids, know what you're promoting. I suppose that's the tricky thing, though, isn't it? I mean, you know, we've all been there in uh, in whatever environment it may be. And, you know, you, it's all about development. But then, you know, when it comes to the game, you know, you've seen those coaches maybe or, you know, maybe coaches under pressure. Maybe, you know, we've all been guilty of it sometimes that you get in, involved in that, you know, atmosphere when you want to win the game or, you know, get sucked into that. And, you know, some coaches obviously under pressure more from their bosses, whether it's an elite level or grassroots level where, you know they they you know they're being told they want to win the game or you know so maybe they don't, those players don't get the opportunity as much to stay on the ball and make those mistakes and develop those key attributes that we see abroad more sometimes. 
Yeah, mate, winning is, is not an ugly word in Brazil. It's not an ugly word in Germany. It's not an ugly word in Holland. Winning is everything. That's why they do, that's why they stick to their philosophy every single day because they believe in it. And that is that every day you stick to that philosophy, you're winning. Every day you develop yourself, you're winning. And when it comes to games, what I would say is you know, win, like really want to win as well and teach young kids to do uh, whatever it takes within your style to win. But win with style. Do you know what I mean? Know that um, how to win and, 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 and the style of play in terms of winning. I think that was always what was promoted at Chelsea and Liverpool as well. Chelsea had their style of play, which was different to Liverpool's, but we wanted to win, but we had boundaries to win. Do you know what I mean? We had sort of like styles that, that was our style. We wanted to win within our style. But what I do see in Brazil and, and, and Argentina and South America in general is they will do anything to win. And, and if anyone thinks that the football here is 100% style and creativity, well, when it comes to the difference between winning or losing, they will do anything it takes to win. And uh, a lot less gentleman-like than we are back home. So winning's not an ugly word here. It's the absolute the obsession. It's what drives everything. I suppose the key it's, amazing, it's about how you, how you go about getting there, right? It's about how you go about winning, yeah. And I think that that was maybe a mistake that we made a few years ago. But that... that Whenever it's very hard for the FA and the governing bodies, what I would say to to people is, within your club, just make sure you can go to sleep at night. Make sure you're doing the best for kids, you know, the best that you'd want for your son or your daughter, and make sure you, you know, because that's a smaller community, that's easier to sort of manage. And that's how I always saw the job at Liverpool and Chelsea that you make it very personal in house at your club. You know, I have no, in, in the future, I have no aspirations to work for the FA because I think it's, it's a very thankless task. I think it's very hard to see if the good work's going on because it takes too long to get around the country and everyone to buy into it. It's much easier to make one club move forward very quickly, I believe. And I think there's lots of good academy managers and good coaches out there. I think they're just disserved by the Premier League and, and not getting kids through. You know, like, so we keep looking for solutions underneath the radar because we can't see players get through. But actually, the problem is the Premier League. You know, so anyone that works in the game is infused by our young players. And the England youth uh, squads at the moment are getting good results. And if any coach travels abroad with uh, young, young groups from under 12s, even younger, up to the under 23 age group, goes out into Europe, people really respect what's going on in England. You know, in other countries, they like what's happening. But they don't have the same problems we have at getting players through the top end. So um, finally, then, mate, on that note, I mean, what what advice would you give for a young aspiring coach to you know you've come through that your inspiring road and you know you're moving around you're you're, tra you're working abroad what would, what's, what what advice would you give for someone who's just starting on that road or was on that road and wants to you know get to somewhere like where you are? I would say work with every sort work a lot really work every day as much as you can because what I probably missed out earlier is I worked in women's football, I worked with disability kids, I worked football in the community, I had my mixed um, ability group at my soccer school, worked through the age group, so really I had a load of experiences. Them experiences far outweighed any one session I saw from a super coach, far outweighed any book that I wrote, just getting out there and getting that cold face learning of being out on the pitch, working with different coaches, sharing ideas that were going through the same journey as me. And I think it's just that. I think it's um, as you go through working out what your strengths are as a coach, there's lots of different types of coaches. And so when you're watching a coach, is he a good uh, coach at planning exercises? Is he a good communicator? Is he a good in inspirer? Is he a good tactician? because there's different types of coaches. So try to work out what your personality is and be the best you can. Try to work out which age group you think you are the best at coaching at and, and, and really then try to inspire the kids. I think stick close to the game. I think there's so many exercises that come so far away from the game. It work a lot on one-to-ones and use the beauty of every group is as fast kids, slow kids, good dribblers, good defenders, good passers. So if you play 1v1, you can give a kid experience of playing against real different personalities and, and shapes and sizes within any, any team. So lots of 1v1s and then play the game, attack and defend the goals, make the players happy, enjoying football, make it competitive. And I think you'll see a lot of gains over time. 
Michael Bill, thank you so much. Uh, it's been really informative, informative, inspirational. Appreciate your time, mate. Brilliant, so thanks, mate. Thanks for tuning in to the MyPersonalFootballCoach.com Soccer Player Development Podcast. MyPersonalFootballCoach.com's dynamic ball mastery program is the world's leading online individual technical training program, proven and developed at the highest level in the English Premier League. Sign up now to train like the pros and take your game to the next level. Master the ball, master the game.